This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Aaron Hockwimmer in Auckland, New Zealand. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Four. Had the administration been faultless, the enthusiasm with which the return of the king and the termination of the military tyranny had been hailed could not have been permanent. For it is the law of our nature that such fits of excitement shall always be followed by remissions. The manner in which the court abused its victory made the remission speedy and complete. Every moderate man was shocked by the insolence, cruelty, and perfidy with which the nonconformists were treated. The penal laws had effectually purged the oppressed party of those insincere members whose vices had disgraced it and had made it again an honest and pious body of men. The Puritan, a conqueror, a ruler, a persecutor, a sequestrator, had been detested. The Puritan, betrayed and evil entreated, deserted by all the time service who, in his prosperity, had claimed brotherhood with him, hunted from his home, forbidden under severe penalties to pray or receive the sacrament according to his conscience, yet still firm in his resolution to obey God rather than man, was, in spite of some unpleasing recollections, an object of pity and respect to well-constituted minds. These feelings became stronger when it was noised abroad that the court was not disposed to treat papists with the same rigour which had been shown to Presbyterians. A vague suspicion that the king and the duke were not sincere Protestants, sprang up and gathered strength. Many persons to who had been disgusted by the austerity and hypocrisy of the saints of the commonwealth began to be still more disgusted by the open profligacy of the court and of the cavaliers, and were disposed to doubt whether the sullen preciseness of praise God barebone might not be preferable to the outrageous profaneness and licentiousness of the Buckinghams and Sedleys. Even immoral men, who were not utterly destitute of sense and public spirit, complained that the government treated the most serious matters as trifles, and made trifles its serious business. A king might be pardoned for amusing his leisure with wine, wit, and beauty, but it was intolerable that he should sink into a mere lounger and voluptuary, that the gravest affairs of state should be neglected, and that the public service should be starved and the finances deranged in order that harlots and parasites might grow rich. A large body of royalists joined in these complaints and added many sharp reflections on the king's ingratitude. His whole revenue, indeed, would not have sufficed to reward them all in proportion to their unconsciousness of desert. For to every distressed gentleman who had fought under Rupert or Derby, his own services seemed eminently meritorious, and his own sufferings eminently severe. Every one had flattered himself that, whatever became of the rest, he should be largely recompensed for all that he had lost during the civil troubles, and that the restoration of the monarchy would be followed by the restoration of his own dilapidated fortunes. None of these expectants could restrain his indignation when he found that he was as poor under the king as he had been under the rump of the protector. The negligence and extravagance of the court excited the bitter indignation of these loyal veterans. They justly said that one half of what his majesty squandered on concubines and buffoons would gladden the hearts of hundreds of old cavaliers who, after cutting down their oaks and melting their plate to help his father, now wandered about in threadbare suits and did not know where to turn for a meal. At the same time, a sudden fall of rents took place. The income of every landed proprietor was diminished by five shillings in the pound. The cry of agricultural distress rose from every shire in the kingdom, and for that distress the government was, as usual, held accountable. The gentry, compelled to retrench their expenses for a period, 
saw with indignation the increasing splendour and profusion of Whitehall, and were immovably fixed in the belief that the money which ought to have supported their households had, by some inexplicable process, gone to the favourites of the king. The minds of men were now in such a temper that every public act excited discontent. Charles had taken to wife Catherine, Princess of Portugal. The marriage was generally disliked, and the murmurs became loud when it appeared that the king was not likely to have any legitimate posterity. Dunkirk, won by Oliver from Spain, was sold to Louis the Fourteenth, King of France. This bargain excited general indignation. Englishmen were already beginning to observe with uneasiness the progress of the French power, and to regard the House of Bourbon with the same feeling with which their grandfathers had regarded the House of Austria. Was it wise, men asked, at such a time, to make any addition to the strength of a monarchy already too formidable? Dunkirk was, moreover, prized by the people, not merely as a place of arms and as a key to the Low Countries, but also as a trophy of English valour. It was to the subjects of Charles what Calais had been to an early generation, and what the rock of Gibraltar, so manfully defended through disastrous and perilous years, against the fleets and armies of a mighty coalition, is to ourselves. The plea of economy might have had some weight, if it had been urged by an economical government, but it was notorious that the charges of Dunkirk fell far short of the sums which were wasted at court in vice and folly. It seemed insupportable that a sovereign, profuse beyond example in all that regarded his own pleasures, should be niggardly in all that regarded the safety and honour of the state. The public discontent was heightened when it was found that, while Dunkirk was abandoned on the plea of economy, the fortress of Tangier, which was part of the dower of Queen Catherine, was repaired and kept up at an enormous charge. That place was associated with no recollections gratifying to the national pride. It could in no way promote the national interests. It involved us in inglorious, unprofitable, and interminable wars with the tribes of half-savage Mussulmans, and it was situated in a climate singularly unfavourable to the health and vigour of the English race. But the murmurs excited by these errors were faint, when compared with the clamours which soon broke forth. The government engaged in war with the United Provinces. The House of Commons readily voted sums unexampled in our history, sums exceeding those which had supported the fleets and armies of Cromwell at the time when his power was the terror of all the world. But such was the extravagance, dishonesty, and incapacity of those who had succeeded to his authority that this liberality proved worse than useless. The psychopaths of the court, ill-qualified to contend against the great men who then directed the arms of Holland, against such statesmen as De Witt, and such a commander as De Ruta, made fortunes rapidly, while the sailors mutinied from very hunger, while the dockyards were unguarded, while their ships were leaky and without rigging. It was at length determined to abandon all schemes of offensive war, and it soon appeared that even a defensive war was a task too hard for that administration. The Dutch fleet sailed up the Thames and burned the ships of war which lay at Chatham. It was said, on the very day of that great humiliation, the king feasted with the ladies of his seraglio and amused himself with hunting a moth about the supper-room. Then at length tardy justice was done to the memory of Oliver. Everywhere men magnified his valour, genius, and patriotism. Everywhere it was remembered how, when he ruled, all foreign powers had trembled at the name of England, how the States-General, now so haughty, had crouched at his feet, and how, when it was known that he was no more, Amsterdam was lighted up as for a great deliverance, and children ran along the canals, shouting for joy that the devil was dead. Even royalists exclaimed that the state could be saved only by calling the old soldiers of the Commonwealth to arms. Soon the capital began to feel the miseries of a blockade. Fuel was scarcely to be procured. Tilbury Fort, the place where Elizabeth had, with manly spirit, 
hurled foul scorn at Parma and Spain, was insulted by the invaders. The roar of foreign guns was heard for the first time by the citizens of London. In the council it was seriously proposed that, if the enemy advanced, the tower should be abandoned. Great multitudes of people assembled in the streets, crying out that England was bought and sold. The houses and carriages of the ministers were attacked by the populace, and it seemed likely that the government would have to deal at once with an invasion and with an insurrection. The extreme danger, it is true, soon passed by. A treaty was concluded, very different from the treaties which Oliver had been in the habit of signing, and the nation was once more at peace, but it was in a mood scarcely less fierce and sullen than in the days of shipmany. The discontent engendered by maladministration was heightened by calamities which the best administration could not have averted. While the ignominious war with Holland was raging, London suffered two great disasters, such as never, in so short a space of time, befell one city. A pestilence, surpassing in horror any that during three centuries had visited the island, swept away in six months. More than a hundred thousand human beings. And scarcely had the dead cart ceased to go its rounds, when a fire such as had not been known in Europe since the conflagration of Rome under Nero laid in ruins the whole city, from the tower to the temple, and from the river to the Perlius of Smithfield. Had there been a general election, while the nation was smarting under so many disgraces and misfortunes, it is probable that the Roundheads would have regained ascendancy in the state. But the Parliament was still the Cavalier Parliament, chosen in the transport of loyalty which had followed the Restoration. Nevertheless, it soon became evident that no English legislature, however loyal, would now consent to be merely what the legislature had been under the Tudors. From the death of Elizabeth to the eve of the Civil War, the Puritans, who predominated in the representative body, had been constantly, by a dexterous use of the power of the purse, encroaching on the province of the executive government. The gentlemen who, after the Restoration, filled the lower house, though they abhorred the Puritan name, were well pleased to inherit the fruit of the Puritan policy. They were indeed most willing to employ the power which they possessed in the state for the purpose of making their king mighty and honoured, both at home and abroad. But with the power itself they resolved not to part. The great English revolution of the 17th century, that is to say, the transfer of the supreme control of the executive administration from the crown to the House of Commons, was, through the whole long existence of this Parliament, proceeding noiselessly, but rapidly and steadily. Charles, kept poor by his follies and vices, wanted money. The Commons alone could legally grant him money. They could not be prevented from putting their own price on their grants. The price which they put on their grants was this, that they should be allowed to interfere with every one of the king's prerogatives, to wring from him his consent to laws which he disliked, to break up cabinets, to dictate the course of foreign policy, and even to direct the administration of war. To the royal office and the royal person, they loudly and sincerely professed the strongest attachment. But to Clarendon they owed no allegiance, and they fell on him as furiously as their predecessors had fallen on Strafford. The minister's virtues and vices alike contributed to his ruin. He was the ostensible head of the administration, and was therefore held responsible even for those acts which he had strongly but vainly opposed in council. He was regarded by the Puritans, and by all who pitied them, as an implacable bigot, a second loud with much more than loud's understanding. He had on all occasions maintained that the act of indemnity ought to be strictly observed, and this part of his conduct, though highly honourable to him, made him hateful to all those royalists who wished to repair their ruined fortunes by suing the round heads for damages and mesny profits. The Presbyterians of Scotland attributed to him the downfall of their church. 
the Pappus of Ireland attributed to him the loss of their lands. As father of the Duchess of York, he had an obvious motive for wishing that there might be a barren queen, and he was therefore suspected of having purposefully recommended one. The sale of Dunkirk was justly imputed to him. For the war with Holland, he was, with less justice, held accountable. His hot temper, his arrogant deportment, the indelicate eagerness with which he grasped at riches, the ostentation with which he squandered them, his picture gallery, filled with masterpieces of Van Dyck, which had once been the property of ruined cavaliers, his palace, which reared its long and stately front right opposite to the humbler residence of our kings, drew on him much deserved, and some undeserved, censure. When the Dutch fleet was in the Thames, it was against the Chancellor that the rage of the populace was chiefly directed. His windows were broken, the trees of his garden were cut down, and a gibbet was set up before his door. But nowhere was he more detested than in the House of Commons. He was unable to perceive that the time was fast approaching when that house, if it continued to exist at all, must be supreme in the state, when the management of that house would be the most important department of politics, and when, without the help of the men possessing the ear of that house, it would be impossible to carry on the government. He obstinately persisted in considering the Parliament as a body in no respect, differing from the Parliament which had been sitting when, forty years before, he first began to study law at the temple. He did not wish to deprive the legislature of those powers which were inherent in it by the old constitution of the realm, but the new development of those powers, though a development natural, inevitable, and to be prevented only by utterly destroying the powers themselves, disgusted and alarmed him. Nothing would have induced him to put the great seal to a writ for raising ship money, or to give his voice in counsel for committing a member of parliament to the tower, on account of words spoken in debate. But, when the commons began to inquire in what manner the money voted for the war had been wasted, and to examine into the maladministration of the navy, he flamed with indignation. Such inquiry, according to him, was out of their province. He admitted that the house was a most loyal assembly, that it had done good service to the crown, and that its intentions were excellent, but, both in public and in the closet, he, on every occasion, expressed his concern that gentlemen so sincerely attached to monarchy should unadvisedly encroach on the prerogative of the monarch. Widely as they differed in spirit from the members of the long parliament, they yet, he said, imitated that parliament in meddling with matters which lay beyond the sphere of the estates of the realm, and which were subject to the authority of the crown alone. The country, he maintained, would never be well governed till the knights of shires and the burgesses were content to be what their predecessors had been in the days of Elizabeth. All well, the plans which men more observant than himself, of the signs of that time proposed, for the purpose of maintaining a good understanding between the court and the commons, he disdainfully rejected as crude projects, inconsistent with the old polity of England. Towards the young orators, who were rising to distinction and authority in the lower house, his deportment was ungracious, and he succeeded in making them, with scarcely an exception, his deadly enemies. Indeed, one of his most serious faults was an inordinate contempt for youth, and this contempt was the more unjustifiable, because his own experience in English politics was by no means proportioned to his age. For so great a part of his life had been passed abroad that he knew less of the world in which he found himself on his return than many who might have been his sons. For these reasons he was disliked by the commons. For very different reasons he was equally disliked by the court. His morals, as well as his politics, were those of an earlier generation. Even when he was a young law student, living much with men of wit and pleasure, his natural gravity and his religious principles had to a great extent preserved him from the contagion of fashionable debauchery, and he was by no means likely, in advanced years and in declining health, to turn libertine. 
On the vices of the young and gay, he looked with an aversion almost as bitter and contemptuous as that which he felt for the theological errors of the sectaries. He missed no opportunity of showing his scorn of the mimics, revelers, and courtesans who crowded the palace, and the admonitions which he addressed to the king himself were very sharp, and, what Charles disliked still more, very long. Scarcely any voice was raised in favour of a minister, loaded with the double odium of faults, which roused the fury of the people, and of virtues which annoyed and importuned the sovereign. Southampton was no more. Ormond performed the duties of friendship manfully and faithfully, but in vain. The Chancellor fell with a great ruin. The seal was taken from him. The commons impeached him. His head was not safe. He fled from the country. An act was passed which doomed him to perpetual exile, and those who had assailed and undermined him began to struggle for the fragments of his power. The sacrifice of Clarendon, in some degree, took off the edge of the public appetite for revenge. Yet was the anger excited by the profusion and negligence of the government, and by the miscarriages of the late war, by no means extinguished. The councillors of Charles, with the fate of the Chancellor before their eyes, were anxious for their own safety. They accordingly advised their master to soothe the irritation which prevailed both in the Parliament and throughout the country, and for that end to take a step which has no parallel in the history of the House of Stuart, and which was worthy of the prudence and magnanimity of Oliver. End of Part 4 Is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Five. We have now reached a point at which the history of the great English Revolution begins to be complicated with the history of foreign politics. The power of Spain had, during many years, been declining. She still, it is true, held in Europe the Milanese and the two Sicilies, Belgium and Franche Comte. In America, her dominion still spread on both sides of the equator, far beyond the limits of the torrid zone. But this great body had been smitten with palsy, and was not only incapable of giving molestation to other states, but could not, without assistance, repel aggression. France was now, beyond all doubt, the greatest power in Europe. Her resources have, since those days, absolutely increased, but have not increased so fast as the resources of England. It must also be remembered that, a hundred and eighty years ago, the empire of Russia, now a monarchy of the first class, was as entirely out of the system of European politics as Abyssinia or Siam, that the house of Brandenburg was then hardly more powerful than the house of Saxony, and that the republic of the United States had not then begun to exist. The weight of France, therefore, though still very considerable, has relatively diminished. Her territory was not in the days of Louis the Fourteenth quite so extensive as at present, but it was large, compact, fertile, well placed both for attack and for defence, situated in a happy climate, and inhabited by a brave, active, and ingenious people. The state implicitly obeyed the direction of a single mind. The great fiefs, which three hundred years before had been, in all but name, independent principalities, had been annexed to the crown. Only a few old men could remember the last meeting of the states-general. The resistance which the Huguenots, the nobles, and the parliaments had offered to the kingly power had been put down by the two great cardinals, who had ruled the nation during forty years. The government was now a despotism. But, at least in its dealings with the upper classes, a mild and generous despotism tempered by courteous manners and chivalrous sentiments. The means at the disposal of the sovereign were, for that age, truly formidable. His revenue raised, 
it is true, by a severe and unequal taxation, which pressed heavily on the cultivators of the soil, far exceeded that of any other potentate. His army, excellently disciplined, and commanded by the greatest generals then living, already consisted of more than a hundred and twenty thousand men. Such an array of regular troops had not been seen in Europe since the downfall of the Roman Empire. Of maritime powers France was not the first, but though she had rivals on the sea, she had not yet a superior. Such was her strength during the last forty years of the seventeenth century that no enemy could singly withstand her, and that two great coalitions in which half Christendom was united against her failed of success. The personal qualities of the French king added to the respect inspired by the power and importance of his kingdom. No sovereign has ever represented the majesty of a great state with more dignity and grace. He was his own prime minister, and performed the duties of a prime minister with an ability and industry which could not be reasonably expected, from one who had, in infancy, succeeded to a crown, and who had been surrounded by flatterers before he could speak. He had shown, in an eminent degree, two talents invaluable to a prince, the talent of choosing his servants well, and the talent of appropriating to himself the chief part of the credit of their acts. In his dealings with foreign powers he has some generosity, but no justice. To unhappy allies who threw themselves at his feet, and had no hope but in his compassion, he extended his protection with a romantic disinterestedness, which seemed better suited to a knight-errant than to a statement. But he broke through the most sacred ties of public faith, without scruple or shame, whenever they interfered with his interest or with what he called his glory. His perfidy and violence, however, excited less enmity than the insolence with which he constantly reminded his neighbours of his own greatness, and of their littleness. He did not at this time profess the austere devotion which at a later period gave to his court the aspect of a monastery. On the contrary, he was as licentious, though by no means as frivolous and indolent, as his brother of England, but he was a sincere Roman Catholic, and both his conscience and his vanity impelled him to use his power for the defence and propagation of the true faith. After the example of his renowned predecessors, Clovis, Charlemagne, and St. Louis, our ancestors naturally looked with serious alarm on the growing power of France. This feeling, in itself perfectly reasonable, was mingled with other feelings less praiseworthy. France was our old enemy. It was against France that the most glorious battles recorded in our annals had been fought. The conquest of France had been twice effected by the Plantagenets. The loss of France had been long remembered as a great national disaster. The title of King of France was still borne by our sovereigns. The lilies of France still appeared mingled with our own lions on the shield of the House of Stuart. In the sixteenth century, the dread inspired by Spain had suspended the animosity of which France had anciently been the object. But the dread inspired by Spain had given place to contemptuous compassion, and France was again regarded as our national foe. The sale of Dunkirk to France had been the most generally unpopular act of the restored king. Attachment to France had been prominent among the crimes imputed by the commons to Clarendon. Even in trifles the public feeling showed itself. When a brawl took place in the streets of Westminster between the retinues of the French and Spanish embassies, the populace, though forcibly prevented from interfering, had given unequivocal proofs that the old antipathy to France was not extinct. France and Spain were now engaged in a more serious contest. One of the chief objects of the policy of Louis throughout his life was to extend his dominions towards the Rhine. For this end he had engaged in war with Spain, and he was now in the full career of conquest. The United Provinces saw with anxiety the progress of his arms. That renowned federation had reached the heights of power, prosperity, and glory. 
the Batavian territory, conquered from the waves and defended against them by human art, was in extent little superior to the Principality of Wales. But all that narrow space was a busy and populous hive, in which new wealth was every day created, and to which vast masses of old wealth were hoarded. The aspect of Holland, the rich cultivation, the innumerable canals, the ever-whirling mills, the endless fleets of barges, the quick succession of great towns, the ports bristling with thousands of masts, the large and stately mansions, the trim villas, the richly furnished apartments, the picture galleries, the summer rouses, the tulip beds, produced on English travellers in that age an effect similar to the effect which the first sight of England now produces on a Norwegian or a Canadian. The States-General had been compelled to humble themselves before Cromwell, but after the Restoration they had taken their revenge, and had waged war with success against Charles, and had concluded peace on honourable terms. Rich, however, as the Republic was, and highly considered in Europe, she was no match for the power of Louis. She apprehended not without good cause, that his kingdom might soon be extended to her frontiers. And she might well dread the immediate vicinity of a monarch so great, so ambitious, and so unscrupulous. Yet it was not easy to devise any expedient which might avert the danger. The Dutch alone could not turn the scale against France. On the side of the Rhine no help was to be expected. Several German princes had been gained by Louis, and the Emperor himself was embarrassed by the discontents of Hungary. England was separated from the United Provinces by the recollection of cruel injuries recently inflicted and endured, and a policy had, since the Restoration, been so devoid of wisdom and spirit that it was scarcely possible to expect from her any valuable assistance. But the fate of Clarendon, and the growing ill-humour of the Parliament, determined the advisers of Charles to adopt, on a sudden, a policy which amazed and delighted the nation. The English resident at Brussels, Sir William Temple, one of the most expert diplomatists and most pleasing writers of the age, had already represented to this court that it was both desirable and practicable to enter into engagements with the States-General for the purpose of checking the progress of France. For a time his suggestions had been slighted, but it was now thought expedient to act on them. He was commissioned to negotiate with the States-General. He proceeded to The Hague, and soon came to an understanding with John de Witt, then the chief minister of Holland. Sweden, small as her resources were, had, forty years before, been raised by the genius of Gustavus Adolphus to a high rank among European powers, and had not yet descended to her natural position. She was induced to join on this occasion with England and the States. Thus was formed that coalition known as the Triple Alliance. Louis showed signs of vexation and resentment, but did not think it politic to draw on himself the hostility of such a confederacy, in addition to that of Spain. He consented, therefore, to relinquish a large part of the territories which his armies had occupied. Peace was restored to Europe, and the English government, lately an object of general contempt, was, during a few months, regarded by foreign powers with respect, scarcely less than that which the protector had inspired. At home, the Triple Alliance was popular in the highest degree. It gratified alike national animosity and national pride. It put a limit to the encroachments of a powerful and ambitious neighbour. It bound the leading Protestant states together in a close union. Cavaliers and roundheads rejoiced in common. But the joy of the roundhead was even greater than that of the cavalier, for England had now allied herself strictly with a country republican in government and Presbyterian in religion, against a country ruled by an arbitrary prince and attached to the Roman Catholic Church. The House of Commons loudly applauded the treaty, and some uncourtly grumblers described it as the only good thing that had been done since the King came in. The King, however, cared little for the approbation of his Parliament or of his people. 
The Triple Alliance he regarded merely as a temporary expedient for quieting discontents, which had seemed likely to become serious. The independence, the safety, the dignity of the nation, over which he presided, were nothing to him. He had begun to find constitutional restraints galling. Already had been formed in the Parliament a strong connection, known by the name of the Country Party. That party included all the public men who leaned towards Puritanism and Republicanism, and many who, though attached to the Church and to hereditary monarchy, had been driven into opposition by dread of popery, by dread of France, and by disgust at the extravagance, dissoluteness, and faithlessness of the court. The power of this band of politicians was constantly growing. Every year, some of those members who had been returned to Parliament during the loyal excitement of 1661 had dropped off, and the vacant seats had generally been filled by persons less tractable. Charles did not think himself a king while an assembly of subjects could call for his account before paying his debts, and could insist on knowing which of his mistresses or boon companions had intercepted the money destined for the equipping and manning of the fleet. Though not very studious of fame, he was galled by the taunts which were sometimes uttered in the discussions of the commons, and on one occasion attempted to restrain the freedom of speech by disgraceful means. Sir John Coventry, a country gentleman, had, in debate, sneered at the profligacy of the court. In any former reign he would probably have been called before the Privy Council and committed to the Tower. A different course was now taken. A gang of bullies was secretly sent to slit the nose of the offender. This ignoble revenge, instead of quelling the spirit of opposition, raised such a tempest that the King was compelled to submit to the cruel humiliation of passing an act which had tainted the instruments of his revenge, and which took from him the power of pardoning them. But, impatient as he was of constitutional restraints, how was he to emancipate himself from them? He could make himself despotic only by the help of a great standing army, and such an army was not in existence. His revenues did, indeed, enable him to keep up some regular troops. But those troops, though numerous enough to excite great jealousy and apprehension in the House of Commons and in the country, were scarcely numerous enough to protect Whitehall and the Tower against the rising of the mob of London. Such risings were indeed to be dreaded, for it was calculated that in the capital and its suburbs dwelt not less than twenty thousand of Oliver's old soldiers. Since the King was bent on emancipating himself from the control of Parliament, and since, in such an enterprise, he could not hope for effectual aid at home, it followed that he must look for aid abroad. The power and wealth of the King of France might be equal to the arduous task of establishing absolute monarchy in England. Such an ally would undoubtedly expect substantial proofs of gratitude for such a service. Charles must descend to the rank of a great vassal, and must make peace and war according to the directions of the government which protected him. His relation to Louis would closely resemble that in which the Raja of Nagpur and the King of Oude now stand to the British government. Those princes are bound to aid the East India Company in all hostilities, defensive and offensive, and to have no diplomatic relations, but such as the East India Company shall sanction. The Company, in turn, guarantees them against insurrection, as long as they faithfully discharge their obligation to the paramount power. They are permitted to dispose of large revenues, to fill their palaces with beautiful women, to besot themselves in the company of their favourite revellers, and to oppress with impunity any subject who may incur their displeasure. Such a life would be insupportable to a man of high spirit and of powerful understanding, but to Charles, sensual, indolent, unequal to any strong intellectual exertion, and destitute alike of all patriotism and of all sense of personal dignity, the prospect had nothing unpleasing. That the Duke of York should have concurred in the design of degrading that crown which was probable that he would himself one day wear, may seem more extraordinary, for his nature was haughty and imperious, and indeed he continued to the very last to show, by occasional starts and struggles, his impatience 
of the French yoke. But he was almost as much debased by superstition as his brother by indolence and vice. James was now a Roman Catholic. Religious bigotry had become the dominant sentiment of his narrow and stubborn mind, and had so mingled itself with his love of rule that the two passions could hardly be distinguished from each other. It seemed highly improbable that without foreign aid he would be able to attain ascendancy or even toleration for his own faith, and he was in a temper to see nothing humiliating in any step which might promote the interest of the true church. A negotiation was opened, which lasted during several months. The chief agent between the English and French courts was the beautiful, graceful, and intelligent Henrietta, Duchess of Orléans, sister of Charles, sister-in-law of Louis, and a favourite with both. The King of England offered to declare himself a Roman Catholic, to dissolve the Triple Alliance, and to join with France against Holland, if France would engage to lend him such military and pecuniary aid as might make him independent of his Parliament. Louis at first affected to receive these propositions coolly, and at length agreed to them with the air of a man who is conferring a great favour. But, in truth, the course which he had resolved to take was one by which he might gain and could not lose. It seems certain that he never seriously thought of establishing despotism and popery in England by force of arms. He must have been aware that such an enterprise would be in the highest degree arduous and hazardous, that it would task to the utmost all the energies of France during many years, and that it would be altogether incompatible with more promising schemes of aggrandizement which were dear to his heart. He would, indeed, willingly have acquired the merit and the glory of doing a great service on reasonable terms to the church of which he was a member. But he was little disposed to imitate his ancestors, who in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries had led the flower of French chivalry to die in Syria and Egypt, and he well knew that a crusade against Protestantism in Great Britain would not be less perilous than the expeditions in which the armies of Louis the Seventh and of Louis the Ninth had perished. He had no motive for wishing the Stuarts to be absolute. He did not regard the English constitution with feelings at all resembling those which have in later times induced princes to make war on the free institutions of neighbouring nations. At present, a great party zealous for popular government has ramifications in every civilised country. An important advantage gained anywhere by that party is almost certain to be the signal for general commotion. It is not wonderful that governments threatened by a common danger should combine for the purpose of mutual insurance, but in the seventeenth century no such danger existed. Between the public mind of England and the public mind of France there was a great gulf. Our institutions and our factions were as little understood at Paris as at Constantinople. It may be doubted whether any one of the forty members of the French Academy had an English volume in his library, or knew Shakespeare, Johnson, or Spencer, even by name. A few Huguenots, who had inherited the mutinous spirit of their ancestors, might perhaps have a fellow-feeling with their brethren, in the faith the English roundheads. But the Huguenots had ceased to be formidable. The French, as a people, attached to the Church of Rome, and proud of the greatness of their king, and of their own loyalty, looked on our struggles against popery and arbitrary power, not only without admiration or sympathy, but with strong disapprobation and disgust. It would therefore be a great error to ascribe the conduct of Louis to apprehensions at all resembling those which, in our age, induced the Holy Alliance to interfere in the internal troubles of Naples and Spain. Nevertheless, the propositions made by the court of Whitehall were most welcome to him. He already meditated gigantic designs which were destined to keep Europe in constant fermentation during more than forty years. He wished to humble the United Provinces and to annex Belgium, French Comte and Lorraine to his dominions. Nor was this all. The King of Spain was a sickly child. It was likely he would die without issue. His eldest sister was Queen of France. A day would almost certainly come, and might come very soon, 
when the house of Bourbon might lay claim to that vast empire on which the sun never set. The union of the two great monarchies under one head would doubtless be opposed by a continental coalition. But for any continental coalition, France single-handed was a match. England could turn the scale, on the course which, in such a crisis, England might pursue. The destinies of the world would depend, and it was notorious that the English Parliament and nation were strongly attached to the policy which had dictated the Triple Alliance. Nothing, therefore, could be more gratifying to Louis than to learn that the princes of the House of Stuart needed his help, and were willing to purchase that help by unbounded subserviency. He determined to profit by the opportunity, and laid down for himself a plan to which, without deviation, he adhered till the revolution of 1688 disconcerted all his politics. He professed himself desirous to promote the designs of the English court. He promised large aid. He from time to time doled out such aid as might serve to keep hope alive, and as he could without risk or inconvenience spare. In this way, at an expense very much less than that which he occurred in building and decorating Versailles, or Marley, he succeeded in making England, during nearly twenty years, almost as insignificant a member of the political system of Europe as the Republic of San Marino. His object was not to destroy our constitution, but to keep the various elements of which it was composed in a perpetual state of conflict, and to set irreconcilable enmity between those who had the power of the purse and those who had the power of the sword. With this view he bribed and stimulated both parties in turn, pensioned at once the ministers of the crown and the chiefs of the opposition, encouraged the court to withstand the seditious encroachments of the parliament, and conveyed to the parliament intimations of the arbitrary designs of the court. One of the devices to which he resorted for the purposes of obtaining an ascendancy in the English councils deserves a special notice. Charles, though incapable of love in the highest sense of the word, was the slave of any woman whose person excited his desires, and whose airs and prattle amused his leisure. Indeed, a husband would be justly derided who should bear from a wife of exalted rank and spotless virtue half the insolence which the King of England bore from concubines, who, while they owed everything to his bounty, caressed his courtiers almost before his face. He had patiently endured the termagant passions of Barbara Palmer and the pert vivacity of Eleanor Gwynne. Louis thought that the most useful envoy who could be sent to London would be a handsome, licentious, and crafty Frenchwoman. Such a woman was Louisa, a lady of the house of Caraville, whom our rude ancestors called Madame Carwell. She was soon triumphant over all her rivals, was created Duchess of Portsmouth, was loaded with wealth, and obtained a dominion which ended only with the life of Charles. The most important conditions of the alliance between the crowns were digested into a secret treaty which was signed at Dover in May 1670, just ten years after the day on which Charles had landed at that very port, amidst the acclamations and joyful tears of a too confiding people. By this treaty, Charles bound himself to make public profession of the Roman Catholic religion, to join his arms to those of Louis for the purposes of destroying the power of the United Provinces, and to employ the whole strength of England by land and sea in support of the rights of the House of Bourbon to the vast monarchy of Spain. Louis, on the other hand, engaged to pay a large subsidy, and promised that, if any insurrection should break out in England, he would send an army at his own charge to support his ally. This compact was made with gloomy auspices. Six weeks after it had been signed and sealed, the charming princess, whose influence over her brother and brother-in-law had been so pernicious to her country, was no more. Her death gave rise to horrible suspicions, which for a moment seemed likely to interrupt the newly formed friendship between the houses of Stuart and Bourbon. But in a short time, 
fresh assurances of undiminished goodwill were exchanged between the confederates. The Duke of York, too dull to apprehend danger, or too fanatical to care about it, was impatient to see the article touching the Roman Catholic religion carried into immediate execution. But Louis had the wisdom to perceive that, if this course were taken, there would be such an explosion in England as would probably frustrate those parts of the plan which he had most at heart. It was therefore determined that Charles should still call himself a Protestant, and should still at high festivals receive the sacrament according to the ritual of the Church of England. His more scrupulous brother ceased to appear in the royal chapel. About this time died the Duchess of York, daughter of the banished Earl of Clarendon. She had been, during some years, a concealed Roman Catholic. She left two daughters, Mary and Anne, afterwards successively queens of Great Britain. They were bred Protestants by the positive command of the king, who knew that it would be vain for him to profess himself a member of the Church of England, if children who seemed likely to inherit his throne were, by his permission, brought up as members of the Church of Rome. The principal servants of the crown at this time were men whose names have justly acquired an unenviable notoriety. We must take heed, however, that we do not load their memory with infamy, which of right belongs to their master. For the Treaty of Dover, the king himself is chiefly answerable. He held conferences on it with the French agents. He wrote many letters concerning it with his own hand. He was the person who first suggested the most disgraceful articles which it contained, and he carefully concealed some of those articles from the majority of his cabinet. End of part five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Book One, Chapter Two, Part Six. Few things in our history are more curious than the origin and growth of the power now possessed by the cabinet. From an early period the kings of England had been assisted by a privy council, to which the law assigned many important functions and duties. During several centuries this body deliberated on the gravest and most delicate affairs. But by degrees its character changed. It became too large for despatch and secrecy. The rank of privy councillor was often bestowed as an honorary distinction on persons to whom nothing was confided, and whose opinion was never asked. The sovereign, on the most important occasions, resorted for advice to a small knot of leading ministers. The advantages and disadvantages of this course were early pointed out by Bacon, with his usual judgment and sagacity but it was not till after the Restoration that the Interior Council began to attract general notice. During many years old-fashioned politicians continued to regard the Cabinet as an unconstitutional and dangerous board. Nevertheless, it constantly became more and more important. It at length drew to itself the chief executive power, and has now been regarded, during several generations, as an essential part of our polity. Yet, strange to say, it still continues to be altogether unknown to the law. The names of the noblemen and gentlemen who compose it are never officially announced to the public. No record is kept of its meetings and resolutions, nor has its existence ever been recognized by any act of Parliament. During some years the word cabal was popularly used as synonymous with cabinet. But it happened by a whimsical coincidence that, in 1671, the cabinet consisted of five persons, the initial letters of whose names made up the word cabal. Clifford, Arlington, Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale. These ministers were therefore emphatically called the cabal, and they soon made that appellation so infamous that it has never since their time been used except 
as a term of reproach. Sir Thomas Clifford was a commissioner of the Treasury, and had greatly distinguished himself in the House of Commons. Of the members of the cabal he was the most respectable, for, with a fiery and imperious temper, he had a strong, though a lamentably perverted, sense of duty and honour. Henry Bennet, Lord Arlington, then Secretary of State, had since come to manhood, resided principally on the continent, and had learned that cosmopolitan indifference to constitutions and religions which is often observable in persons whose life has been passed in vagrant diplomacy. If there was any form of government which he liked, it was that of France. If there was any church for which he felt a preference, it was that of Rome. He had some talent for conversation, and some talent also for transacting the ordinary business of office. He had learned, during a life passed in travelling and negotiating, the art of accommodating his language and deportment to the society in which he found himself. His vivacity in the closet amused the king, his gravity in debates and conferences imposed on the public. And he had succeeded in attaching to himself, partly by services and partly by hopes, a considerable number of personal retainers. Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale were men in whom the immorality which was epidemic among the politicians of that age appeared in its most malignant type, but variously modified by great diversities of temper and understanding. Buckingham was a sated man of pleasure, who had turned to ambition as to a pastime. As he had tried to amuse himself with architecture and music, with writing farces and with seeking for the philosopher's stone, so he now tried to amuse himself with a secret negotiation and a Dutch war. He had already, rather from fickleness and love of novelty than from any deep design, been faithless to every party. At one time he had ranked among the cavaliers. At another time warrants had been out against him for maintaining a treasonable correspondence with the remains of the Republican party in the city. He was now again a courtier, and was eager to win the favour of the king by services from which the most illustrious of those who had fought and suffered for the royal house would have recoiled with horror. Ashley, with a far stronger head, and with a far fiercer and more earnest ambition, had been equally versatile. But Ashley's versatility was the effect not of levity, but of deliberate selfishness. He had served, and betrayed, a succession of governments. But he had timed all his treacheries so well, that through all revolutions his fortunes had constantly been rising. The multitude, struck with admiration by a prosperity which, while everything else was constantly changing, remained unchangeable, attributed to him a prescience almost miraculous, and likened him to the Hebrew statesman of whom it is written that his counsel was as if a man had inquired of the oracle of God. Lauderdale, loud and coarse both in mirth and anger, was, perhaps, under the outward show of boisterous frankness, the most dishonest man in the whole cabal. He had made himself conspicuous among the Scotch insurgents of 1638 by his zeal for the covenant. He was accused of having been deeply concerned in the sale of Charles I to the English Parliament, and was therefore, in the estimation of good cavaliers, a traitor, if possible, of a worse description than those who had sate in the high court of justice. He often talked with a noisy jocularity of the days when he was a canter and a rebel. He was now the chief instrument employed by the court in the work of forcing episcopacy on his reluctant countrymen, nor did he in that cause shrink from the unsparing use of the sword, the halter, and the boot. Yet those who knew him knew that thirty years had made no change in his real sentiments, that he still hated the memory of Charles I, and that he still preferred the Presbyterian form of church government to every other. Unscrupulous as Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale were, 
it was not thought safe to entrust to them the king's intention of declaring himself a Roman Catholic. A false treaty, in which the article concerning religion was omitted, was shown to them. The names and seals of Clifford and Arlington are affixed to the genuine treaty. Both these statesmen had a partiality for the old church, a partiality which the brave and vehement Clifford, in no long time manfully avowed, but which the colder and meaner Arlington concealed, till the near approach of death scared him into sincerity. The three other cabinet ministers, however, were not men to be kept easily in the dark, and probably suspected more than was distinctly avowed to them. They were certainly privy to all the political engagements contracted with France, and were not ashamed to receive large gratifications from Lewis. The first object of Charles was to obtain from the Commons supplies which might be employed in executing the secret treaty. The cabal, holding power at a time when our government was in a state of transition, united in itself two different kinds of vices belonging to two different ages, and to two different systems. As those five evil counsellors were among the last English statesmen who seriously thought of destroying the Parliament, so they were the first English statesmen who attempted extensively to corrupt it. We find in their policy at once the latest trace of the thorough of Strafford, and the earliest trace of that methodical bribery which was afterwards practised by Walpole. They soon perceived, however, that, though the House of Commons was chiefly composed of cavaliers, and though places and French gold had been lavished on the members, there was no chance that even the least odious parts of the scheme arranged at Dover would be supported by a majority. It was necessary to have recourse to fraud. The King professed great zeal for the principles of the Triple Alliance, and pretended that, in order to hold the ambition of France in check, it would be necessary to augment the fleet. The Commons fell into the snare, and voted a grant of eight hundred thousand pounds. The Parliament was instantly prorogued, and the Court, thus emancipated from control, proceeded to the execution of the great design. The financial difficulties, however, were serious. A war with Holland could be carried on only at enormous cost. The ordinary revenue was not more than sufficient to support the government in time of peace. The eight hundred thousand pounds out of which the commons had just been tricked would not defray the naval and military charge of a single year of hostilities. After the terrible lesson given by the long parliament, even the cabal did not venture to recommend benevolences or ship-money. In this perplexity Ashley and Clifford proposed a flagitious breach of public faith. The goldsmiths of London were then not only dealers in the precious metals, but also bankers, and were in the habit of advancing large sums of money to the government. In return for these advances they received assignments on the revenue, and were repaid with interest as the taxes came in. About thirteen hundred thousand pounds had been in this way entrusted to the honour of the state. On a sudden it was announced that it was not convenient to pay the principal, and that the lenders must content themselves with interest. They were consequently unable to meet their own engagements. The exchange was in an uproar, several great mercantile houses broke, and dismay and distress spread through all society. Meanwhile, rapid strides were made towards despotism. Proclamations dispensing with acts of Parliament, or enjoining what only Parliament could lawfully enjoin, appeared in rapid succession. Of these edicts the most important was the Declaration of Indulgence. By this instrument the penal laws against Roman Catholics were set aside. And, that the real object of the measure might not be perceived, the laws against Protestant nonconformists were also suspended. A few days after the appearance of the Declaration of Indulgence, war was proclaimed against the United Provinces. By sea the Dutch maintained the struggle with honour, 
but on land they were at first borne down by irresistible force. A great French army passed the Rhine. Fortress after fortress opened its gates. Three of the seven provinces of the Federation were occupied by the invaders. The fires of the hostile camp were seen from the top of the Stadthaus of Amsterdam. The Republic, thus fiercely assailed from without, was torn at the same time by internal dissensions. The government was in the hands of a close oligarchy of powerful burghers. There were numerous self-elected town councils, each of which exercised within its own sphere many of the rights of sovereignty. These councils sent delegates to the provincial states, and the provincial states again sent delegates to the states-general. A hereditary first magistrate was no essential part of this polity. Nevertheless, one family, singularly fertile of great men, had gradually obtained a large and somewhat indefinite authority. William, first of the name, Prince of Orange Nassau, and Stadtholder of Holland, had headed the memorable insurrection against Spain. His son, Maurice, had been captain-general, and first minister of the States, had, by eminent abilities and public services, and by some treacherous and cruel actions, raised himself to almost kingly power, and had bequeathed a great part of that power to his family. The influence of the Stadtholders was an object of extreme jealousy to the municipal oligarchy. But the army, and that great body of citizens which was excluded from all share in the government, looked on the burgomasters and deputies with a dislike resembling the dislike with which the legions and the common people of Rome regarded the Senate, and were as zealous for the house of Orange as the legions and the common people of Rome for the house of Caesar. The Stadtholder commanded the forces of the commonwealth, disposed of all military commands, had a large share of the civil patronage, and was surrounded by pomp almost regal. Prince William the Second had been strongly opposed by the oligarchical party. His life had terminated in the year 1650, amidst great civil troubles. He died childless. The adherents of his house were left for a short time without a head, and the powers which he had exercised were divided among the town councils, the provincial states, and the states-general. But, a few days after William's death, his widow, Mary, daughter of Charles I, King of Great Britain, gave birth to a son, destined to raise the glory and authority of the House of Nassau to the highest point, to save the United Provinces from slavery, to curb the power of France, and to establish the English Constitution on a lasting foundation. The prince, named William Henry, was from his birth an object of serious apprehension to the party now supreme in Holland, and of loyal attachment to the old friends of his line. He enjoyed high consideration as the possessor of a splendid fortune, as the chief of one of the most illustrious houses in Europe, as a magnet of the German Empire, as a prince of the blood royal of England, and, above all, as the descendant of the founders of Batavian liberty. But the high office which had once been considered as hereditary in his family remained in abeyance, and the intention of the aristocratical party was that there should never be another stadtholder. The want of a first magistrate was, to a great extent, supplied by the grand pensionary of the province of Holland, John de Witt, whose abilities, firmness, and integrity had raised him to unrivalled authority in the councils of the municipal oligarchy. The French invasion produced a complete change. The suffering and terrified people raged fiercely against the government. In their madness they attacked the bravest captains and the ablest statesmen of the distressed commonwealth. De Reuter was insulted by the rabble. De Witt was torn in pieces before the gate of the palace of the States-General at the Hog. The Prince of Orange, who had no share in the guilt of the murder, but who, on this occasion, as on another lamentable occasion twenty years later, extended to crimes perpetrated in his cause an indulgence 
which has left a stain on his glory, became chief of the government without a rival. Young as he was, his ardent and unconquerable spirit, though disguised by a cold and sullen manner, soon roused the courage of his dismayed countrymen. It was in vain that both his uncle and the French king attempted by splendid offers to seduce him from the cause of the Republic. To the States-General he spoke a high and inspiriting language. He even ventured to suggest a scheme which has an aspect of antique heroism, and which, if it had been accomplished, would have been the noblest subject for epic song that is to be found in the whole compass of modern history. He told the deputies that, even if their natal soil, and the marvels with which human industry had covered it, were buried under the ocean, all was not lost. The Hollanders might survive Holland. Liberty and pure religion, driven by tyrants and bigots from Europe, might take refuge in the farthest isles of Asia. The shipping in the ports of the Republic would suffice to carry two hundred thousand emigrants to the Indian archipelago. There the Dutch commonwealth might commence a new and more glorious existence, and might rear, under the southern cross, amidst the sugar-canes and nutmeg-trees, the exchange of a wealthier Amsterdam, and the schools of a more learned Leiden. The national spirit swelled and rose high. The terms offered by the Allies were firmly rejected. The dikes were opened. The whole country was turned into one great lake, from which the cities, with their ramparts and steeples, rose like islands. The invaders were forced to save themselves from destruction by a precipitate retreat. Lewis, who, though he sometimes thought it necessary to appear at the head of his troops, greatly preferred a palace to a camp, had already returned to enjoy the adulation of poets and the smiles of ladies, in the newly planted alleys of Versailles. And now the tide turned fast. The event of the maritime war had been doubtful. By land the United Provinces had obtained a respite, and a respite, though short, was of infinite importance. Alarmed by the vast designs of Lewis, both the branches of the great house of Austria sprang to arms. Spain and Holland, divided by the memory of ancient wrongs and humiliations, were reconciled by the nearness of the common danger. From every part of Germany troops poured towards the Rhine. The English government had already expended all the funds which had been obtained by pillaging the public creditor. No loan could be expected from the city. An attempt to raise taxes by the royal authority would have at once produced a rebellion, and Lewis, who had now to maintain a contest against half Europe, was in no condition to furnish the means of coercing the people of England. It was necessary to convoke the Parliament. In the spring of 1673, therefore, the Houses reassembled after a recess of nearly two years. Clifford, now a peer and Lord Treasurer, and Ashley, now Earl of Shaftesbury and Lord Chancellor, were the persons on whom the king principally relied as parliamentary managers. The country party instantly began to attack the policy of the cabal. The attack was made, not in the way of storm, but by slow and scientific approaches. The commons at first held out hopes that they would give support to the king's foreign policy, but insisted that he should purchase that support by abandoning his whole system of domestic policy. Their chief object was to obtain the revocation of the Declaration of Indulgence. Of all the many unpopular steps taken by the government, the most unpopular was the publishing of this declaration. The most opposite sentiments had been shocked by an act so liberal, done in a manner so despotic. All the enemies of religious freedom, and all the friends of civil freedom, found themselves on the same side and these two classes made up nineteen-twentieths of the nation. The zealous churchmen exclaimed against the favour which had been shown both to the Papist and to the Puritan. The Puritan, though he might rejoice in the suspension of the persecution by which he had been harassed, 
felt little gratitude for a toleration which he was to share with Antichrist. And all Englishmen who valued liberty and law saw with uneasiness the deep inroad which the prerogative had made into the province of the legislature. It must in candour be admitted that the constitutional question was then not quite free from obscurity. Our ancient kings had undoubtedly claimed and exercised the right of suspending the operation of penal laws. The tribunals had recognised that right. Parliaments had suffered it to pass unchallenged. That some such right was inherent in the crown, few even of the country party ventured, in the face of precedent and authority, to deny. Yet it was clear that, if this prerogative were without limit, the English government could scarcely be distinguished from a pure despotism. That there was a limit was fully admitted by the king and his ministers. Whether the declaration of indulgence lay within or without the limit was the question, and neither party could succeed in tracing any line which would bear examination. Some opponents of the government complained that the declaration suspended not less than forty statutes. But why not forty as well as one? There was an orator who gave it as his opinion that the king might constitutionally dispense with bad laws, but not with good laws. The absurdity of such a distinction it is needless to expose. The doctrine which seems to have been generally received in the House of Commons was, that the dispensing power was confined to secular matters, and did not extend to laws enacted for the security of the established religion. Yet, as the king was supreme head of the church, it should seem that, if he possessed the dispensing power at all, he might well possess that power where the church was concerned. When the courtiers on the other side attempted to point out the bounds of this prerogative, they were not more successful than the opposition had been. The truth is that the dispensing power was a great anomaly in politics. It was utterly inconsistent in theory with the principles of mixed government, but it had grown up in times when people troubled themselves little about theories. It had not been very grossly abused in practice. It had therefore been tolerated, and had gradually acquired a kind of prescription. At length it was employed, after a long interval, in an enlightened age, and at an important conjecture, to an extent never before known, and for a purpose generally abhorred. It was instantly subjected to a severe scrutiny. Men did not, indeed, at first venture to pronounce it altogether unconstitutional, but they began to perceive that it was at direct variance with the spirit of the Constitution, and would, if left unchecked, turn the English government from a limited into an absolute monarchy. Under the influence of such apprehensions, the commons denied the king's right to dispense, not indeed with all penal statutes, but with penal statutes in matters ecclesiastical, and gave him plainly to understand that, unless he renounced that right, they would grant no supply for the Dutch war. He, for a moment, showed some inclination to put everything to hazard, but he was strongly advised by Lewis to submit to necessity, and to wait for better times, when the French armies, now employed in an arduous struggle on the continent, might be available for the purpose of suppressing discontent in England. In the cabal itself the signs of disunion and treachery began to appear. Shaftesbury, with his proverbial sagacity, saw that a violent reaction was at hand, and that all things were tending towards a crisis resembling that of 1640. He was determined that such a crisis should not find him in the situation of Strafford. He therefore turned suddenly round, and acknowledged, in the House of Lords, that the declaration was illegal. The King, thus deserted by his ally and by his Chancellor, yielded, cancelled the declaration, and solemnly promised that it should never be drawn into precedent. Even this concession was insufficient. The commons, not content with having forced their sovereign to annul the indulgence, next extorted his unwilling assent to a celebrated law, which continued in force down to the reign of George the Fourth. This law, 
known as the Test Act, provided that all persons holding any office, civil or military, should take the oath of supremacy, should subscribe a declaration against transubstantiation, and should publicly receive the sacrament according to the rites of the Church of England. The preamble expressed hostility only to the Papists. But the enacting clauses were scarcely more unfavourable to the Papists than to the rigid Puritans. The Puritans, however, terrified at the evident leaning of the court towards Popery, and encouraged by some churchmen to hope that, as soon as the Roman Catholics should have been effectually disarmed, relief would be extended to Protestant nonconformists, made little opposition, nor could the king, who was in extreme want of money, venture to withhold his sanction. The act was passed, and the Duke of York was consequently under the necessity of resigning the great place of Lord High Admiral. Hitherto the Commons had not declared against the Dutch war, but when the King had, in return for money cautiously doled out, relinquished his whole plan of domestic policy, they fell impetuously on his foreign policy. They requested him to dismiss Buckingham and Lauderdale from his councils for ever, and appointed a committee to consider the propriety of impeaching Arlington. In a short time the cabal was no more. Clifford, who alone of the five had any claim to be regarded as an honest man, refused to take the new test, laid down his white staff, and retired to his country seat. Arlington quitted the post of Secretary of State for a quiet and dignified employment in the royal household. Shaftesbury and Buckingham made their peace with the opposition, and appeared at the head of the stormy democracy of the city. Lauderdale, however, still continued to be Minister for Scotch Affairs, with which the English Parliament could not interfere. And now the Commons urged the King to make peace with Holland, and expressly declared that no more supplies should be granted for the war, unless it should appear that the enemy obstinately refused to consent to reasonable terms. Charles found it necessary to postpone to a more convenient season all thought of executing the Treaty of Dover, and to cajole the nation by pretending to return to the policy of the Triple Alliance. Temple, who, during the ascendancy of the Cabal, had lived in seclusion among his books and flower-beds, was called forth from his hermitage. By his instrumentality a separate peace was concluded with the United Provinces, and he again became ambassador at the Hague, where his presence was regarded as a sure pledge for the sincerity of his court. End of Part 6 Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 11, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Seven. The chief direction of affairs was now entrusted to Sir Thomas Osborne, a Yorkshire baronet who had in the House of Commons shown eminent talents for business and debate. Osborne became Lord Treasurer, and was soon created Earl of Danby. He was not a man whose character, if tried by any high standard of morality, would appear to merit approbation. He was greedy of wealth and honours, corrupt himself, and a corrupter of others. The cabal had bequeathed to him the art of bribing parliaments, an art still rude and giving little promise of the rare perfection to which it was brought in the following century. He improved greatly on the plan of the first inventors. They had merely purchased orators, but every man who had a vote might sell himself to Danby. Yet the new minister must not be confounded with the negotiators of Dover. He was not without the feelings of an Englishman and a Protestant nor did he, in his solicitude for his own interests, ever wholly forget the interests of his country and of his religion. 
He was desirous, indeed, to exalt the prerogative, but the means by which he proposed to exalt it were widely different from those which had been contemplated by Arlington and Clifford. The thought of establishing arbitrary power by calling in the aid of foreign arms, and by reducing the kingdom to the rank of a dependent principality, never entered into his mind. His plan was to rally round the monarchy, those classes which had been firm allies of the monarchy, during the troubles of the preceding generation and which had been disgusted by the recent crimes and errors of the court. With the help of the old cavalier interest of the nobles, of the country gentlemen, of the clergy, and of the universities, it might, he conceived, be possible to make Charles not indeed an absolute sovereign, but a sovereign scarcely less powerful than Elizabeth had been. Prompted by these feelings, Danby formed the design of securing to the cavalier party the exclusive possession of all political power, both executive and legislative. In the year 1675, accordingly, a bill was offered to the Lords, which provided that no person should hold any office, or should sit in either House of Parliament, without first declaring an oath that he considered resistance to the kingly power as, in all cases, criminal, and that he would never endeavour to alter the government, either in church or state. During several weeks, the debates, divisions, and protests caused by this proposition kept the country in a state of excitement. The opposition in the House of Lords, headed by two members of the cabal who were desirous to make their peace with the nation, Buckingham and Shaftesbury, was beyond all precedent vehement and pertinacious, and at length proved successful. The bill was not indeed rejected, but was retarded, mutilated, and at length suffered to drop. So arbitrary and so exclusive was Danby's scheme of domestic policy. His opinions touching foreign policy did him more honour. They were, in truth, directly opposed to those of the cabal, and differed little from those of the country party. He bitterly lamented the degraded situation to which England was reduced, and declared with more energy than politeness that his dearest wish was to cudgel the French into a proper respect for her. So little did he disguise his feelings, that, at a great banquet, where the most illustrious dignitaries of the state and of the church were assembled, he, not very decorously, filled his glass to the confusion of all who were against the war with France. He would, indeed, most gladly, have seen his country united with the powers which were there combined against Louis, and was for that end bent on placing Temple, the author of the Triple Alliance, at the head of the department which directed foreign affairs but the power of the Prime Minister was limited. In his most confidential letters he complained that the infatuation of his master prevented England from taking her proper place among European nations. Charles was insatiably greedy of French gold. He had by no means relinquished the hope that he might, at some future day, be able to establish absolute monarchy by the help of the French arms and for both reasons he wished to maintain a good understanding with the court of Versailles. Thus the sovereign leaned toward one system of foreign politics, and the minister toward a system diametrically opposite. Neither the sovereign nor the minister, indeed, was of a temper to pursue any object with undeviating constancy. Each occasionally yielded to the importunity of the other. Their jarring inclinations and mutual concessions gave to the whole administration a strangely capricious character. Charles, sometimes from levity and indolence, suffered Danby to take steps which Louis resented as mortal injuries. Danby, on the other hand, rather than relinquish his great place, sometimes stooped to compliances which caused him bitter pain and shame. The king was brought to consent to a marriage between the Lady Mary, eldest daughter and presumptive heiress of the Duke of York, and William of Orange, the deadly enemy of France, and the hereditary champion of the Reformation. Nay, the brave Earl of Ossory, son of Ormond, was sent to assist the Dutch with some British troops, who on the most bloody day of the whole war signally vindicated the national reputation for stubborn courage. The treasurer, on the other hand, was induced not only to connive at some scandalous pecuniary transactions which took place between his master and the court of Versailles, but to become, unwillingly indeed, and ungraciously, an agent in those transactions. Meanwhile, the country party was driven by two strong feelings in two opposite directions. The popular leaders were afraid of the greatness of Louis, 
who was not only making head against the whole strength of the Continental Alliance, but was even gaining ground. Yet they were afraid to entrust their own king with the means of curbing France, lest those means should be used to destroy the liberties of England. The conflict between these apprehensions, both of which were perfectly legitimate, made the policy of the opposition seem as eccentric and fickle as that of the court. The Commons called for a war with France, till the king, pressed by Danby, to comply with their wish, seemed disposed to yield, and began to raise an army. But as soon as they saw that the recruiting had commenced, their dread of Louis gave place to a nearer dread. They began to fear that the new levies might be employed on a service in which Charles took more interest than in the defence of Flanders. They therefore refused supplies, and clamouring for disbanding as loudly as they had just before clamoured for arming. Those historians who have severely reprehended this inconsistency do not appear to have made sufficient allowance for the embarrassing situation of subjects, who have reason to believe that their prince is conspiring with a foreign and hostile power against their liberties. To refuse him military resources is to leave the state defenceless, yet to give him military resources may be only to arm him against the state. In such circumstances vacillation cannot be considered as a proof of dishonesty or even weakness. These jealousies were studiously fomented by the French king. He had long kept England passive by promising to support the throne against the Parliament. He now, alarmed at finding that the patriotic counsels of Danby seemed likely to prevail in the closet, began to inflame the Parliament against the throne. Between Louis and the country party there was one thing, and one only in common, profound distrust of Charles. Could the country party have been certain that their sovereign meant only to make war on France, they would have been eager to support him. Could Louis have been certain that the new levies were intended only to make war on the constitution of England, he would have made no attempt to stop them, but the unsteadiness and faithlessness of Charles were such that the French government and the English opposition, agreeing in nothing else, agreed in disbelieving his protestations, and were equally desirous to keep him poor and without an army. Communications were opened between Barillon, the ambassador of Louis, and those English politicians who had always professed, and who indeed sincerely felt, the greatest dread and dislike of the French ascendancy. The most upright of the country party, William Lord Russell, son of the Earl of Bedford, did not scruple to concert with the foreign mission schemes for embarrassing his own sovereign. This was the whole extent of Russell's offence. His principles and his fortune alike raised him above all temptations of a sordid kind, but there is too much reason to believe that some of his associates were less scrupulous. It would be unjust to impute to them the extreme wickedness of taking bribes to injure their country. On the contrary, they meant to serve her. But it is impossible to deny that they were mean and indelicate enough to let a foreign prince pay them for serving her. Among those who cannot be acquitted of this degrading charge was one man who is popularly considered as the personification of public spirit, and who, in spite of some great moral intellectual faults, has a just claim to be called a hero, a philosopher, and a patriot. It is impossible to see, without pain, such a name in the list of the pensioners of France, yet it is some consolation to reflect that in our time a public man will be thought lost to all sense of duty and of shame, who should not spurn from him a temptation which conquered the virtue and pride of Algernon Sidney. The effect of these intrigues was that England, though she occasionally took a menacing attitude, remained inactive, till the Continental War, having lasted nearly seven years, was terminated by the Treaty of Nimeguen. The United Provinces, which in 1672 had seemed to be on the verge of utter ruin, obtained honourable and advantageous terms. This narrow escape was generally ascribed to the ability and courage of the young stadtholder. His fame was great throughout Europe, and especially among the English, who regarded him as one of their own princes, and rejoiced to see him the husband of their future queen. France retained many important towns in the Low Countries, and the great province of Franche Comte. Almost the whole loss was borne by the decaying monarchy of Spain. 
A few months after the termination of hostilities on the continent came a great crisis in English politics. Towards such a crisis, things had been tending during eighteen years. The whole stock of popularity, great as it was, with which the King had commenced his administration, had long been expended. To loyal enthusiasm had succeeded profound disaffection. The public mind had now measured it back again the space over which it had passed between 1640 and 1660, and was once more in the state in which it had been when the long Parliament met. The prevailing discontent was compounded of many feelings. One of these was wounded national pride. That generation had seen England during a few years allied on equal terms with France, victorious over Holland and Spain, the mistress of the sea, the terror of Rome, the head of the Protestant interest. Her resources had not diminished, and it might have been expected that she would have been at least as highly considered in Europe under a legitimate king, strong in the affection and willing obedience of his subjects, as she had been under a usurper whose utmost vigilance and energy were required to keep down a mutinous people. Yet she had, in consequence of the imbecility and meanness of her rulers, sunk so low that any German or Italian principality which brought five thousand men into the fields was a more important member of the Commonwealth of Nation. With the sense of national humiliation was mingled anxiety for civil liberty. Rumours, indistinct indeed, but perhaps the more alarming by reason of their indistinctness, imputed to the court a deliberate design against all the constitutional rights of Englishmen. It had even been whispered that this design was to be carried into effect by the intervention of foreign arms. The thought of such intervention made the blood, even of the cavaliers, boil in their veins. Some, who had always professed the doctrine of non-resistance in its full extent, were now heard to mutter that there was one limitation to that doctrine— a foreign force were brought over to coerce the nation, they would not answer for their own patience. But neither national pride nor anxiety for public liberty had so great an influence on the popular mind as hatred of the Roman Catholic religion. That hatred had become one of the ruling passions of the community, and was as strong in the ignorant and profane as in those who were Protestants from conviction. The cruelties of Mary's reign, cruelties which even in the most accurate and sober narrative excites just detestation, and which were neither accurately nor soberly related in the popular martyrologies. The conspiracies against Elizabeth, and above all the gunpowder plot, had left in the minds of the vulgar a deep and bitter feeling, which was kept up by annual commemorations, prayers, bonfires, and processions. It should be added that those classes which were peculiarly distinguished by attachment to the throne, the clergy and the landed gentry, had peculiar reasons for regarding the Church of Rome with aversion. The clergy trembled for their benefices, the landed gentry for their abbeys and great tithes. While the memory of the reign of the saints was still recent, hatred of popery had in some degree given place to hatred of Puritanism. But during the eighteen years which had elapsed since the Restoration, the hatred of Puritanism had abated, and the hatred of Popery had increased. The stipulations of the Treaty of Dover were accurately known to very few, but some hints had got abroad. The general impression was that a great blow was about to be aimed at the Protestant religion. The King was suspected by many of a leaning towards Rome. His brother and heir presumptive was known to be a bigoted Roman Catholic. The first Duchess of York had died a Roman Catholic. James had then, in defiance of the remonstrances of the House of Commons, taken to wife the Princess Mary of Medina, another Roman Catholic. If there should be sons by this marriage, there was reason to fear that they might be bred Roman Catholics, and that a long succession of princes hostile to the established faith might sit on the English throne. The Constitution had recently been violated for the purpose of protecting the Roman Catholics from the penal laws. The ally, by whom the policy of England had during many years been chiefly governed, was not only a Roman Catholic, but a persecutor of the Reformed Churches. 
Under such circumstances it is not strange that the common people should have been inclined to apprehend a return of the times of her whom they called Bloody Mary. Thus the nation was in such a temper that the smallest spark might raise a flame. At this juncture fire was set in two places at once, to the vast mass of combustible matter, and in a moment the whole was in a blaze. The French court, which knew Danby to be its mortal enemy, artfully contrived to ruin him by making him pass for its friend. Louis, by the instrumentality of Ralph Montague, a faithless and shameless man, who had resided in France as minister from England, laid before the House of Commons proofs that the treasurer had been concerned in an application made by the court of Whitehall to the court of Versailles for a sum of money. This discovery produced its natural effect. The treasurer was, in truth, exposed to the vengeance of Parliament, not on account of his delinquencies, but on account of his merits. Not because he had been an accomplice in a criminal transaction, but because he had been a most unwilling and unserviceable accomplice, but of circumstances which have, in the judgment of posterity, greatly extenuated his fault. His contemporaries were ignorant. In their view he was the broker who had sold England to France. It seemed clear that his greatness was at an end, and doubtful whether his head could be saved. Yet was the ferment excited by this discovery slight, when compared with the commotion which arose when it was noised abroad that a great popish plot had been detected. One Titus Oates, a clergyman of the Church of England, had by his disorderly life and heterodox doctrine drawn on himself the censure of his spiritual superiors, had been compelled to quit his benefice, and had ever since led an infamous and vagrant life. He had once professed himself a Roman Catholic, and had passed some time on the continent in English colleges of the Order of Jesus. In those seminaries he had heard much wild talk about the best means of bringing England back to the true Church. From hints thus furnished, he constructed a hideous romance, resembling rather the dream of a sick man than any transaction which ever took place in the real world. The Pope, he said, had entrusted the government of England to the Jesuits. The Jesuits had by commission, under the seal of their society, appointed Roman Catholic clergymen, noblemen and gentlemen, to all the highest officers in church and state. The Papists had burned down London once. They had tried to burn it down again. They were at that same moment planning a scheme for setting fire to all the shipping in the Thames. They were to rise at a signal and massacre all their Protestant neighbours. A French army was at the same time to land in Ireland. All the leading statesmen and divines of England were to be murdered. Three or four schemes had been formed for assassinating the king. He was to be stabbed, he was to be poisoned in his medicine, he was to be shot with silver bullets. The public mind was so sore and excitable that these lies readily found credit with the vulgar, and two events which speedily took place led even some reflecting men to suspect that the tale, though evidently distorted and exaggerated, might have some foundation. Edward Coleman, a very busy and not very honest Roman Catholic intriguer, had been amongst the persons accused. Search was made for his papers. It was found that he had just destroyed the greater part of them, but a few which had escaped contained some passages, such as to minds strongly prepossessed, might seem to confirm the evidence of Oates. Those passages, indeed, when candidly construed, appear to express little more than the hopes which the posture of affairs, the predilections of Charles, the still stronger predilections of James, and the relations existing between the French and English courts, might naturally excite in the mind of a Roman Catholic strongly attached to the interests of his church. But the country was not then inclined to construe the letters of Papists candidly, and it was urged, with some show of reason, that if the papers which had been passed over as unimportant were filled with matter so suspicious, some great mystery of iniquity must have been contained in those documents which had been carefully committed to the flames. A few days later it was known that Sir Edmundsbury Godfrey, an eminent justice of the peace who had taken the depositions of Oates against Coleman, had disappeared. Search was made, and Godfrey's corpse was found in a field near London. 
it was clear that he had died by violence. It was equally clear that he had not been set upon by robbers. His fate is to this day a secret. Some think that he perished by his own hand. Some that he was slain by a private enemy. The most improbable supposition is that he was murdered by the party hostile to the court, in order to give colour to the story of the plot. The most probable supposition seems, on the whole, to be that some hot-headed Roman Catholic, driven to frenzy by the lies of Oates, and by the insults of the multitude, and not nicely distinguishing between the perjured accuser and the innocent magistrate, had taken a revenge, of which the history of persecuted sects furnishes but too many examples. If this were so, the assassin must have afterwards bitterly execrated his own wickedness and folly. The capital and the whole nation went mad with hatred and fear. The penal laws, which had begun to lose something of their edge, were sharpened anew. Everywhere justices were busied in searching houses and seizing papers. All the jails were filled with papists. London had the aspect of a city in a state of siege. The train bands were under arms all night. Preparations were made for barricading the great thoroughfares. Patrols marched up and down the streets. Cannon were planting round Whitehall. No citizen thought himself safe unless he carried under his coat a small flail loaded with lead to brain the popish assassins. The corpse of the murdered magistrate was exhibited during several days to the gaze of great multitudes, and was then committed to the grave, with strange and terrible ceremonies, which indicated rather fear and the thirst of vengeance shall sorrow or religious hope. The houses insisted that a guard should be placed in the vaults over which they sate, in order to secure them against a second gunpowder plot. All their proceedings were of a piece with this demand. Ever since the reign of Elizabeth, the oath of supremacy had been exacted from members of the House of Commons. Some Roman Catholics, however, had contrived so to interpret this oath that they could take it without scruple. A more stringent test was now added. Every member of Parliament was required to make the declaration against such transubstantiation, and thus the Roman Catholic lords were, for the first time, excluded from their seats. Strong resolutions were adopted against the Queen. Commons threw one of the secretaries of state into prison for having countersigned commissions directed to gentlemen who were not good Protestants. They impeached the Lord Treasurer of high treason. Nay, they so far forgot the doctrine which, while the memory of the civil war was still recent, they had loudly professed, that they even attempted to wrest the command of the militia out of the king's hands. To such a temper had eighteen years of misgovernment brought the most loyal Parliament that had ever met in England. Yet it may seem strange that even in that extremity the king should have ventured to appeal to the people, for if the people were more excited than their representatives, the lower house, discontented as it was, contained a large number of cavaliers, than were likely to find seats again. But it was thought that a dissolution would put a stop to the prosecution of the Lord Treasurer, a prosecution which might probably bring to light all the guilty mysteries of the French alliance, and might thus cause extreme personal annoyance and embarrassment to Charles. Accordingly, in January 1679, the Parliament, which had been in existence ever since the beginning of the year 1661, was dissolved, and writs were issued for a general election. End of Part 7